All right, folks, welcome back to the Orlando Soccer Show. It has been a minute, and by a minute, I mean <laughs> like a month. Has it been? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, been a, it's been a while since we've actually done a proper uh, episode. Because the last, the last episode we did was the UCF preview with head coach Tiffany roberts Hayek. So it has been a while. It has yes. been a while. That is the voice of Mike Romajo. I am Austin David. Here we are talking about the beginning of the end because the Orlando City season is almost over. We are recording live from Sylvan Lake Park as we just got out of training talking with head coach James O'Connor, Christian Aguita, Scott Sutter, and we got to watch the guys train for a little bit. So, Mike, first, how are you doing? Not bad. Uh, obviously, uh, we just uh, finished uh, media availability over here at Sylvan Lake Park. Uh, James O'Connor spoke. Uh, Scott Sutter and Christian Higuita spoke. Um, and we got some interesting injury news as well, which are th- obviously it's already on Twitter. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that you know, throughout the show. But, yeah, it's another day. Let's do it. It's another day. At this point, all the days kind of blend together because of just the team's not good. Uh, that, that's kind of the best way to put it. And the thing is, they know it. Uh, Scott Sutter. It's hard you know, not to at this point. They they haven't won a game since July. Yeah, they haven't scored a goal in a month. Four games. That and if you don't I, if you don't know your team is bad by that point, there there's something wrong with you. And and the thing is, obviously these last four games, there aren't really easy opponents because there aren't really easy opponents. You have. Obviously, New England, that's still in the hunt. So they're going to put a full squad there to lock up a playoff spot. Yep. You have Seattle, who's already in the playoffs. So maybe they maybe they might deploy a, a light squad, but you really can't take Seattle light. They're also going to pay for seeding. At, at that, too. Obviously, you, you the high seed is the one who usually plays home. Mm-hmm. New York Red Bulls are going after the supporter shield. So they're going to – my guess is they're going to put a, a full-strength squad at t- towards the end of the season because it's been a neck-and-neck neck battle between them and Atlanta. Yep. You have Columbus, who, I mean, you can say they're they're they're, they're a sure bet to make the playoffs. So also playing for seeding, though. Also playing for seeding. So did I name those f- the last four games of the season right there? That the is, last four yeah. opponents. So obviously, yeah, it's it's not going to be easy to end it. But as you just mentioned, Austin, they have not won a game since July. It was that two one victory against Toronto, and Toronto is also defending MLS Cup champion that were mathematically eliminated from playoff contention over the weekend, along with Orlando City. Yeah, listen, MLS is weird. You have teams that you expect to win end up towards the bottom. Obviously, you have Toronto, but you also have Chicago, who yeah. was very good last year. Orlando is still struggling to make their first ever playoff appearance. They're the only other team outside of Minnesota who's never made it, and Minnesota's been in the league for a total of a year and almost two. Yeah. So, where do we go from here? I think that's the, the bigger question, because the, the games don't matter at this point. There's nothing to play for. They're, they're playing for pride. Uh, Dom Dwyer and Stefano Pino are out for this upcoming game, so James well, O'Connor's going to have to try something at striker. But and that, that's, that's just whatever at this point. And you, you, I mean, and, and James struck on that, saying that there's somewhat of an imbalance in the squad. Mm-hmm. Um, you have pretty much two strikers and the rest are not really attacking minded players yeah well in his opinion he said there's no balance and that needs to be issued right. in the offseason yeah no there really isn't any balance and i feel i feel really bad for looking at the roster at the beginning of the season and saying wow this team is a playoff contender because you look at it now if you look if you went back and looked at it who was outside of dom dwyer gonna score you goals it was supposed to be stefan opinio he's he wasn't unproven though um um Right. Look, and, and I, I think at the, the end thing, of, they got so many guys that set up goals, but not enough guys who could finish. And it doesn't matter how and, good or bad your defense but is. But even if you look at obviously Dwyer did, is, is going to finish as the, the team leading goal scorer, but he's sure. had a bad rut lately. He, yeah, hasn't, he hasn't scored in a while either. He's, and he's had a lot of one one on one opportunities with the goalkeeper, and surprisingly, he's not putting them away. Mm-hmm. You, normally, you will look at your plan B, and your plan B is not. Is not is, is isn't coming through. He scored what two goals this season? In the f- yeah, and this was the first goal was the first game of the season. Yep, and that was a game time goal, but that was ages ago at this point in, in the year. Um, Literally almost a year ago. Obviously, there's. I mean, who who else is the, an attacking minded player? I mean, obviously Christian Higuita is having his best offensive. Year. And he hasn't scored in a while either. He hasn't scored in a while, but he, sc- he scored four goals out of his six career goals with Orlando City this year alone. Yep. 
Um, and it's weird because earlier in the season, well, not want to say earlier in the season, but earlier in the James O'Connor, <laughs> well, I don't want to say era, but one of the first few games under James O'Connor, you see kind of tenure. It's tenure, you can say that. So, you know, early in, in James O'Connor's games as head coach, mm-hmm. you saw Christian Higuita playing with a little bit more freedom, you know, moving a little bit more higher up on the Actually, field. He played as a winger. He played as a winger, right winger. Mm-hmm. And he, he would eventually find his opportunities to score. But lately, obviously, whether it's been injury or, or just, you know, naturally, he's just been – because he's a natural holding midfielder. He yep. naturally drifts back. Um, and it's interesting, too, because we spoke to Christian Higuita. I asked him personally whether he sees himself – play next year he said he has, still has another year in his contract his goal is to make the playoffs he wants to be here he just wants the team to play for the club he's the longest tenured player outside of earl edwards right they're Come the on. only two guys that are left over from the original team uh, the most active player though in orlando city yeah well because as a goalkeeper uh, yeah you really especially as a second stringer earl's had his opportunities but they've been few and far between and then injuries or you know changes in the in the goalkeeping core what have you uh, it's been very intermittent for him. Yeah. And Higita, he's he's going to hold all the records for Orlando City at this point, you know, in terms of longevity because he's played the most games. You know, he's, he's he, he, you kind of look at Christian – when you dice – you know, you look at each of each of Christian Higita's seasons with Orlando City, mm-hmm. I don't really can't think of a bad season he's had. I mean, he's had, I think, whether – He's average, had up and down years, sure. Up and down, but I don't want to say worse. He, they, this season was his worst season. You, you you go back to the 2015 season, the inaugural MLS season, that combo he had with Darwin Seren in the in the in the, in the mid, mm-hmm. and, and and I can't believe I'm looking far as back as that, but I remember Amobi Akuga was supposed to be that starting holy mid alongside mm. Darwin, and Christian just came out of nowhere and he know, started the first he, game. He won, he's, you know, but then he was just became a, a st- he, he started gradually becoming a staple. For Orlando in that midfield. Still when, is. Yeah, and when he came in, he came along with Carlos Rios. Rios was supposed to be the, the big DP signing that they made. Oh. And Higuita was just kind of the afterthought. And, well, look look at what happened now. <laughs> I mean, at this point, you know, I can't believe can't we're going down memory lane now, but at this point, has there even been a, a, a DP that's made a major impact other than Kaká in Orlando City? Yoshi, because he's got the most well, assists. Yoshi, I don't think he's considered a DP. He's, he's, he was he when was. he was signed. Now he's now a TAM player. Right. But as Tenorio says, all TAM players are DPs and all DPs are TAM. Yeah, they're all, they're all interchangeable. <laughs> right. It, it makes no difference at this point. Yeah. And then they're also talking about getting rid of the third DP slot in order for to give the team more TAM or something. Yeah. Which, yeah, that, that's whatever. But I don't think many people are fans of that. Yeah. But... In terms of like impact DPs, I think you could say Yoshi. You know, if he, when he was signed, you know, considering he was signed as a DP, even though he's not now, still could be considured impactful I think because he brings he's an, an atta- well, he's, I don't say, he does, but he brings an attacking edge, whether it's on the flanks, yeah, but also fr- he, he, he brings it from different positions, yeah. right? When Orlando was winning so many games, it was him and Higita in the defensive midfield. And to have a guy like Yotun to be able to spread the ball to all different sides of the pitch in the attack from the defensive holding midfield, that opened up so much for Orlando in the attack. But then it stopped. Yeah. It, uh, you had guys not making runs. You had guys not being able to control those long balls like they did in the beginning of the season. Uh, Yoshi was, was trying to play on the ground instead of going up in the air. And... There, I can remember so many times where Yoshi just bombed a ball down to Chris Mueller down the field. Oh, that was that one goal. Right. <laughs> but that, that happened so many times early in the season, too, where he'd find Mueller on the, on the wing. Mueller would get into the position and, and start creating an attack. Right. And that's why people were so high on Chris Mueller at the beginning of the season. Not only was he scoring goals, but he was creating for his team. And that started from the back. And then it just all kind of fell apart. Be- besides seeing somewhat of a new look Orlando City squad next year, because mm-hmm. obviously the, the term rebuild's been thrown around, and he's yeah, been so a little bit subtle l- in terms me, of that. Before you before you get into that thought, let me talk about the, the whole rebuild concept, because a lot of people are saying, well, get rid of this player, get rid of that player. The, the, the truth of the matter is they can't afford it, 
right? They ha- they, the way that Jason Christ set up this roster was to win now. It didn't matter where, whether the contract was ridiculous, whether the transfer fee was too much or too little. He wanted to save his job. And when he got fired in the middle of the season, all that got thrown out the window. So now Orlando City is stuck with about 60 to 75 percent of the team they have right now because of the contracts that they bought. So when you talk about rebuild, you may have to wait until next year. And by next year, I mean 2020 because of the contracts that they have now, unless they, ch- they choose to buy out those contracts, which will cost millions of dollars then you're probably going to be riding with about 75% of the team that they have right now. That's a good interesting po- topic right there. So with that squad, and, and it's interesting because obviously it's been a while since we recorded the show. Mm. Was it two weeks ago when we uh, ran into former, uh, uh, well, I want to say Orlando City. Well, I, I, I ran uh, earlier in training, uh, Mark Lowry, former Jacksonville F- FC coach, but now mm. El Paso, yeah. USL. And obviously, it was it was just he was just here to watch practice. He was not here to scout. He was just here to, you know, visit James O'Connor. He he they go way back. Yeah. But it's interesting because the interest uh, the conversation me and Larry were having, and he's like, "Listen, it's gonna take time for James to assemble the squad. It's gonna take time." Yeah. Now this is the question I pose, and maybe if you can kind of analyze it, I think I know where you're going. With seventy five percent of the team still stuck. Or some seventy five percent of the players still stuck with this team heading into next season. What do you call success next season? It's a good question. What if the team finishes outside the playoff spot, somewhat similar like in twenty fifteen, or somewhat similar to twenty sixteen? If they finish just outside, just that, is that, is that considering six, considering how they finished today, con- cons- yeah, considering how they finished this season, I'd still say it was a step in the right direction, right? Nothing changes overnight. And I think that's been, the, that's been the biggest thing for this team is that after every season, it seems like because they didn't make the playoffs, the sky is falling, everything is wrong, and they need to change it again. And with that much short turnover, right? Let's go back chronologically. You have the 2015 it season. Hurts, I think it hurts the team's identity. Yeah, it, yeah of course. It, 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 Not it's the club overall, to, but, no, the, the, but the, the team. The roster. Right. Yeah. But like 2015. Paul McDonough's gone. You bring in Carnero. He didn't last that long. He didn't last long. And then you, your GM situation is thrown into a state. 2016, you have a new coach. 2017, your first year in the in the new stadium, and Jason tries to mold his roster and makes a lot but of bad they, 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 Orlando City did go in a similar run like they're going through now. Obviously, this one is a lot worse Yeah, because it's one win, and now in their last – Twenty. Mm-hmm. I stopped counting. It's, yeah, just, it's, it's, just, it's, it's too much. It's ridiculous. But perhaps probably Open Cup. If they make a run at the Open Cup next year, and they miss the playoffs, does that suit well with fans? Does that suit well with the front office? These are questions that I'm posing. Yeah, I, I think at this point in Orlando City's tenure in MLS, it's the fastest way they to win a title. Rush into things like they have in previous years. They can't rush success. They can't rush, you know, the rebuild. Because if they do that, it's not going to work. And it's shown over the last few years that it doesn't. If they rush the process, don't rush it, trust it. You have to be able to trust in what James O'Connor is doing. You have to give him time. You can't say, if you don't make the playoffs this year, you're going to be fired. Right? And, and it was very evident that with Jason Christ. That was the message sent to him. If you don't make the playoffs, if you don't put yourself in a winning situation, you're not long for this team. Because they, they sacked him halfway through. Yeah. Well, now I'm playing devil's advocate here. Worst case scenario, James O'Connor has a really bad start next season. We're going into May, and the team is sitting well off the playoff line. Doesn't, what, what doesn't, is the, I mean, do you have to be patient there? Do you yes. really have to have thick skin? You the, absolutely the, have It's to. obviously the, the front office has shown that – it doesn't have that much patience when it comes to that type of scenarios. You've seen Jason Christ get axed. You've seen Adrian Heath get axed. Right. If, if you're doing that, if, if you... Do you just have to ride the wave then? Right. You have to ride the wave because if you show impatience, then that's your third coach gone in five years. How many other coaches of high caliber are going to say, I want to be in that situation? I want to I be pressured to the fact that 
I have to win with the team I'm given. Not many coaches will, will and there's all, willingly and jump into And there's still that it. underlying factor that there's 75% of the players still right. with the team. Yeah. What I, I think that needs to be highlighted, not only for fans, but probably in the front office. Like, yeah. We well, have it, what we have, and we have to kind of... It, it, we'll see what the team decides to do at the end of the season. Well, yeah, because you can still decline some, the, some options going into the offseason. Correct. But some of those some of those contracts don't have... They, they haven't reached the option years yet. Yep. So that and and if you're going to try and offload contracts, maybe trade them to other teams. You're going to have to take a loss to just get rid of some of these guys. And and that's it's all dependent on what the team decides to do at the end of the day because they have an entire off season to try and figure that out. Here's another question that we need to pose: Is Nikki Bedalich going to be here next year? Because in, in all honesty, he's put together the rosters. With Jason Christ and with uh, was Man, the first the first month of or first few months of Adrian Heath's tenure in twenty sixteen, I think it, I'm up, in my in my opinion, you kind of have to he kind of have to ride the wave with that too. I mean, he but still has to they, make they, some they, signings with the other percent of players that right, they kind of need. But here's here's the thing: they've ridden the wave to this point with Nicky, right? He's been there almost four, uh, three years. He was an assistant GM in twenty sixteen. Phil Rollins, yeah, right. 2017 he took over and now 2018 that's three years of being a big part of putting together rosters and since well, so what signing would what type of signing would save nikki so i don't know say, if there's just uh, one signing a left that winger I could, no, another I don't, center back i don't think there's one signing that can save nikki per se he needs to put together a roster that can have but, some but we, semblance we, but of we success have to keep in mind that there's there still a lot of players locked in right so there's not a lot of room for him to grow, I mean, the, and but that that is also on part due to what Nikki and his signings have done, right? He worked with Jason to make those signings happen. He knew full well that if it didn't work out, that he his team would be stuck with these contracts. And, and as a GM, you need to, to understand that you're taking a risk with that. He took a risk, and to this point, I would say it didn't work, and I think. That's pretty obvious at this point. So you need to take a step back and say, do we need to make a change at GM? Because we made a change at coach already, and we're stuck with these players. What, what can we do from a general manager standpoint to get better players that best suit our coach? Because at this point, that's what you need to do. And here's another thing that I want to bring up, because I'm just on a rant here. Uh, Nicky is a, a Beswick's guy. Right? He came from the Beswick's tree. And, and so did James O'Connor, right? His agency is Beswick's. So that, that's a whole other thing that we could bring up. But um, just interesting to point that out, that those guys are kind of from the, the same tree. Well, so Phil has a connect. Phil Rollins does have a connect with the Beswick people because he, he, he's familiar with Gary Miller. Well, Gary o- also owns a minority stake in the team. Yeah. That's, that's another thing that we can go into, but we're, we'll stay away from that because that's a whole other thing. Uh, the hope is, though, that these guys can work together because they've come from the same tree. Right? Nikki can understand what James is trying to do and, and build around what James is trying to do. And I think if you're trying if if you're Nikki and you're trying to save your job, you have to do what's best for the coach in charge, not do what's best for you as the team and what you're trying to do as the team. Right? I, you look back at some of the signings they made early on, 2015, 2016. Some of those guys, Kaka's friends. Batista, Nocherino, you know, Mateos. Those were kind of favorites to Kaká. Right now, you don't owe anything to anyone in terms of signing these players. You owe, you owe it to the fans. You, well, that's you, obvious. You, you absolutely owe but it to you, the fans. But if, you, if, if, if we're, if we're look, looking at those comparisons there, then has there really been anything owed to the fans? Or how, how am I going to try to phrase this? Hmm. It seems like... The, the way you kind of said it there, it's in the early years of MLS, they built a roster. And, and it obviously, it's, it's obvious they built the roster around Kaká. And that. I r- feel like that was kind of a mistake. In, and in the it was run. a mistake. Yeah. I think it, it, in the long, it definitely in the long run. Um, but you had. With the early parts of MLS, you had to set a precedent. You had to set Kaká as the face of the franchise to get and garner interest. And they did that. Kaká played his part tremendously. Yeah, you, his play on the field could have asked for more. 
But look at where the team is now in terms of fan interaction, in terms of hype and buzz around the city, in terms of advertisement, in terms of news organizations talking about them, talking radio shows. Heck, us right now doing a podcast, right? It wouldn't have been as big as a team, I would say, if they didn't have Kaká. And he, he helped them jump so what, into uh, MLS. You got another star signing? If they can afford it? Who's available? Right, but like... <laughs> That's another question, too. Who's available? Kaká, Kaká did his thing, but the team has shown that they don't need that now. No, they need winning. And right. I think they, winning they is, need, is more marketable as it is. A consistent and coherent team that can play together, not piss each other off, and win games. So you don't look at, say, okay, well, who's the big signing? Who's the next big signing? And you, there, see, you know, you, and it's weird, too, because there, there's a lot of young players in this in this, in this Orlando City team yeah. that if you – and obviously you see a lot of fans on Twitter play the kids. Play the kids? If, if you play the kids – if you plant it, it will grow. <laughs> that is that one cliche saying. But and and I asked James too: Will we see younger faces? Because uh, I mean, you look at these last four games. Orlando's pretty, pretty, pretty. Sh- you know, they're they're shorthanded going yeah. into New England and possibly you know the rest of the games. Do you play the kids? Do you play the younger faces? And James kind of just insinuated, "I'm going to play the younger guys and I'm going to play the experienced guys." But it was a non-answer. Really. It was a non-answer. It's yeah, it, at this point, I'm scratching my head there. <laughs> well, at this point, James, there's a lot of questions about what James has been trying to do because no one can really tell, right? You've had a, ga- a few games now with Will Johnson as a winger. He's not really a winger. I don't know. It's been really complicated trying to figure out what James is doing. For my money, I can, I'm not even going to try and speculate because I'll probably be wrong. At this point, you got to trust in what James is doing. Go into next season hoping that he puts a coherent roster together that he feels comfortable with. And then move on from there. And, and try and take game by game. Don't look at the season and say, we got to make the playoffs. Just say, we got to win this game. And then the next game, we got to win this game. Right? Every year they've been saying, we're going to make the playoffs. We're going to make the playoffs. And I feel like that's been the biggest mistake for this Orlando City team is setting the bar so high that when they don't make it, it feels like such a failure that things need to change. And if you can hear that wind, it's probably uh, Hurricane we're, we're, Michael. We are recording in the middle of a hurricane, essentially. A tropical yeah. storm, you can say. No, not even. I mean, the hurricane's up in Tallahassee. Depression. We're down in Orlando. It's just it's just the, the outer bands that are currently <laughs> running through the training facility. But, yeah, I think we've talked enough about Orlando City in, in the future, in the past, in the present. Just know that it, you know next season is a whole new season, and I'm, int- I'm I'm really interested in seeing how Orlando City B is 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 with the League One is deployed. Yeah, and I mean I think there should be a a a, a note to to fans that Orlando City B is it's gonna be a really really young squad, essentially. It's like a PDL team, pretty much, but in in but the like, professional tag, right? Not amateur semi- tag, pro- professional right. tag. Exactly. And we we were talking about this just a few minutes ago, but I think it's it's probably warranted to go into again. Where do the guys that don't get minutes on the first team go? And those are, I mean, they they need a partnership. Something we asked Jason Kreis at the beginning of this past season was that because they don't have OCB, where are you going to send your guys? They said, well, we're not going to have a formal partnership. We're just going to send guys wherever. They ended up sending most of them to, to St. Louis. But they didn't get that many. They, they, those loans were, they didn't last like that long. Like two games. Yeah. They, they gonna, weren't worth you, it. I think if you're going to loan a player that's not getting any playing time, you'll loan them out for at least half the season with the, with the option to recall that exists all of a sudden. Like what said. Sporting Kansas City did with Dom Dwyer? Well, the, because, but there was an affiliation there. Orlando City did not have an affiliation. A USL right. affiliate. Yes. Um, so, what do you do? You feel that maybe that they should probably have an affiliation next year, well, coming this year I've, to fill in that gap between League One, USL League One, which is technically USL D three. Yep. USL <laughs> Division Two, USL uh, now known as the Championship. The Championship. There's a gap. Mm-hmm. I mean, how are you going to cement that? 
and yeah, and hey, affiliation I know does a, help. I know of a team that would probably affiliate themselves with a James O'Connor team, a purple team. They've already had history of affiliating themselves with Orlando City. The defending USL Cup champions. Including the one of the strikers that just broke the record for most goals in a season. Oh, you're talking about Louisville. I am <laughs> talking about Louisville. Yeah, which one were you talking about? I was talking about Fiorentina. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an interesting one. Yeah. Hey, Italian. you're not good enough to make it to MLS. Go to go to Serie A. Go play over there. <laughs> that that's like a Alternative, uh, uh, alternate reality, right there. Yeah, weird. Shit. How MLS is the best league in the world, and you need to be loaned down to, <laughs> to Serie A. Yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be weird. Anyway, that would be an interesting uh, concept. Partnering up with James O'Connor's f- former team. Again, I think it's also worth noting. Uh, going back a little bit, and I think oh, it's a good, it's a good leeway to go to the next topic. Orlando City has not scored in four games. Yep. They're missing their strikers going into the weekend. Yep. There's no attacking options. Yep. However, yep. there is an attacking team, a scoring team in Orlando, and they have the third best scoring offense in the country. It's not a pro team. It's not a pro team. I believe it is a college team. It's a nation. It's Night Nation. Night Nation. Okay. The UCF yeah, men's soccer UCF. team, uh, victorious again over the weekend. Uh, now they're officially ranked. I mean, they've, they've what nineteenth in the um, United Soccer Coaches poll. Yep, and then seventeen in top drawer soccer. Um, so yeah, they, they Cal Jennings. <laughs> is, is this guy's keeps just, scoring. Just, he, he keeps scoring. He scores when he, he literally scores when he wants, and he's definitely putting UCF right there, um, giving them the scoring edge. The UCF women's soccer team. Uh, they just won their first conference game over the weekend. They're three and one in conference now. Yeah, they beat uh, Cincinnati. Uh, I believe two double now. overtime. Yeah, two double, one, two one, overtime. two one in double overtime. Uh, and obviously, we have the, the the previous episode where we spoke with UCF women's soccer head coach Tiffany Roberts Haydack. So UCF's winning. Uh, that's the UCF report there. What's over, what's 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 popping over there at Rollins? Yeah, Rollins has been an interesting team because well, we'll start with the men's side. They started out winning, and they were winning a lot of games. They were ranked. Very high in the top 25. I think they, they got to about 10 or 15 before the wheels kind of fell off. Oh, boy. And it was it was a rough fall. So they were at one point, I think, 6-1. and one. Now they're 7-5. and five. They're 1-5 and five in conference. They have just had a struggle of a time trying to get any consistency in conference, partly because when they first started their conference schedule, they played the number 18 team in the nation, lost 2 nothing. And then it, it was a straight four straight losses to very good teams before they finally beat Tampa one nothing at home at the beginning of October. Then they went and played the number two team in the nation, only lost one nothing. Mm. Still another loss though. And if they continue going the way they are, they may miss out on the conference tournament altogether and not be able to even push for an NCAA berth because yeah. their their record is just not good enough. So they've got what. Four games left in the season, two home, two away, and they need to win them all. Yeah. That, that's the, the realistic standpoint is they need to win them all to even have – they're not even going to have a 500 record in conference even if they win them all. They'll be four and five. And then on the women's side, the women have been doing really well. And it's, it's not often that you get a lot of draws in college soccer, right? No, nah, Because you have to go to the goal double goal. overtime, and it's goal and goal, right? 110 minutes, two 10-minute overtime periods, and if it finishes, then it's a draw. The women's soccer team for Rollins College has had four draws this season, six wins, and one loss. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and these draws have come against very good teams, top 10 teams, right? Their first game of the season was against the number nine team in the nation. They drew 2-2. They drew the number five team in the nation, Columbus State, back in early September, 1-1. Uh, their most recent away game, they drew Tampa, 0-0, and then they just beat Palm Beach Atlantic, 1-0. So now they have also four games left in the season, two home, two away. Every time that one team plays at home, the other team plays away. So if the men are at home, the women are away. That's, I mean, there's always going to be a game Wednesday and Saturday. Actually, no. 
it always it always usually is Wednesday Saturday, but because it's towards the end of the season, they actually have uh, this coming Saturday off. So they play Wednesday at seven o'clock. By the time you listen to this, the game will be over. Then they have Saturday off. Then they play next Wednesday. Uh, women are at home. Then Saturday away. And then you have the final game of the season against Florida Tech on Tuesday the 23rd. Then the conference schedule starts. The conference tournament schedule starts. And well, then, then it gets fun and interesting. But, you know, last year the men were better than the women. This year the women are better than the men. That's kind of how it goes usually. When, when one team's not good, the other team's good. <laughs> That's always how it's been for the last, like, six years. It's just weird how it does that. Anyway. Any other soccer notes that we want to talk well, the, about? Well, the U.S. women's soccer team plays today at 7.30 on FS2. Yeah. It's Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, that'll be a win. Uh, it's a CONCACAF uh, women's championship, which yep. also oh. places a qualifier to the women's World Cup. They'll, they'll win. Uh, I don't think this, there's any question about them not winning. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, obviously, that's t- it's tonight. Obviously, we're recording tonight this. Tonight being Wednesday. Tonight being and Wednesday. And then tomorrow being Thursday, when you're probably listening to this, that is when... U.S. men's national team play against Colombia in Tampa. And 30,000 tickets have been sold for that game. The, the record is, I believe, it's 31,000. I bet you most of them are probably from Colombia. Uh, versus, it was versus Ecuador set in 2007. Hmm. So, and that's some interesting soccer. That's 30,000 in the Tampa area. But, obviously, yeah, the, 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 I'm pretty sure a large portion of those are South American fans. Yeah. Because we saw Peru show up at Hard Rock during uh, their their send off game before the World Cup earlier this summer. Yeah, it's easier to go to Tampa than to Russia. Yeah, but <laughs> hey, but, hey, but Colombia had one of the largest uh, traveling groups. They did, yeah, almost thirty thousand. So that was the World Cup. This Colombian is friendly, soccer. Um, so we'll see if they end up traveling. All in city plays on Saturday yeah. against New England Revolution. You can watch that on WRDQ. TV twenty seven, TV twenty seven, or YouTube TV, um, and the Prider obviously uh, done. We haven't talked about Tom Sermani being let go. Well, he it's been like a month. Well, he was let go the day we interviewed Timmy Roberts to Haydeck. Yeah. So, um, you know, no, no, it was the, it was the day that we interviewed uh, the men's coach. Yes, uh, yeah, Scott Calabrese. Yes. Because we were getting out of the interview as I got the alert that he was let go. Or they, they mutually parted ways. Yeah. And we're hoping to talk to Tom uh, before he heads back home to Australia uh, for the foreseeable future. He's not coming He's not coming back to Orlando. He's, oh. He doesn't have a place here anymore. So uh, if you see him around town, say goodbye because he's not <laughs> coming back. Um, I have uh, some stuff going up on OSJ Soccer. Yeah. L- earlier next week, I have a, a one-on-one interview with... Uh, OCB head coach Fernando. His last he has a long name. He does. He has a long name. So I'm just Fernando de Arguilla. Or Ar- uh, Arguilla. De Ardita, yeah. He is, he's out there scouting right now across South America. We were talking about this earlier. He's posting his like scouting reports all over the place yeah. on Twitter. I find that hilarious. But uh, I'll be I'll be having a one on one conversation via the phone in Spanish with him, so keep an eye out on a Q Q and A piece over on OSJsoccer.com. Um, and, and questions are going to be mostly composed from OSJ soccer staff, me, Austin, obviously. <laughs> um, but and I'll, I'll transcribe them from Spanish to English. Because he does not speak English. None. But um, it'll be interesting to see his takes on how he's building or how he plans to build OCB. Um, cause Especially because he has, he has a pedigree. He does. You, you look at his, his background in terms of soccer. He was the technical director for the youth team in Barcelona back in the 90s. Yeah. A lot has changed since then, but whenever you have Barcelona and technical director in your title, that that usually is pretty good. Yeah. So, a lot of hope for OCB to help develop talent, and the way that OCB is comprised, you have Montverde in the back. Um, a lot of those guys, you know, they they have the the, the scouting network in Africa. Uh, they're they're in Brazil right now, utilizing the partnership with Atlético Paranaense, which is something that Orlando City really haven't done too much. Leo Pereira is the only other guy that has actually come to Orlando from that team. Yeah, and he's actually like starting for Atlético Paranaense now. So if anything, Orlando City helped shape his career yeah, in can, Brazil. 
it's it's a, it's interesting though because you look at Leo Pereira and his time in Orlando wasn't really all that much. Like it was just kind of like, yeah, he was here. He had glimpses and then he had really bad games. Yeah. You didn't really think like he'd be starting for a team in Brazil right now. But that's it how it goes. Is, yeah. yeah. And just like Australia, you know, he was he's starting for a League 2 team in Portugal. And you, you, have Adama you never and know. Bengay playing. Yeah. Well, Adama's a whole nother thing. That's my boy. Yeah. Um, Gotta get him on the show too. Uh, does he does he speak fluent English? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Last time I remember speaking to him, he kind of well, he kind of struggled with it. He's more mostly French. Nah, well, I, I got a few French speakers. I can give a call. Mm. We'll see. But uh, yeah. Uh, now you see the soccer season's winding down, and I guess this podcast is. This is, up. Yeah, this is this is about time. It's going to start raining soon too. We're we're again we're in a kind of a precarious position here. And as I look up, there's a ton of wasps nest above us. There is. I don't know if they're active or not, but uh, yeah, it it definitely concerns me. Which means we're going to end it here. We'll be back hopefully next week with some some fun interviews uh, with different people. Now that the season's winding down, probably less talk about Orlando City and more just talk about soccer in general maybe get some some good interviews and just have those as normal podcasts instead of just and talking I, for an hour i'm gonna and i'm gonna actually have a poll up uh, sooner or later uh over at osj soccer the twitter handle mm. um and uh, this is actually i'm asking fans um who is obviously the season has not gone the way everyone has hope everyone hoped but uh who's your uh orlando city player of the year i want i want to hear from the fans tweet tweet at osj soccer Kind of want to know, and then I start narrowing down, and I'll, and I'll put up a poll there, and I'll, 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 I'll you know, it's a really tough question. It's a tough question, but there are some players that I, I like to think that, you know, put in a little bit of the work. Um, it's just unfortunate that things just didn't go its way. Yeah. But um, I'm I'm curious. I want to know from the fans out there, and uh, Orlando City fans, who is your Orlando City Player of the Year? Tweet at OSJ Soccer um, on Twitter. So that should and, be a player. Um. I don't know. I mean, it can be <laughs> Kingston for all I know. Oh, God, so. no. Don't even go there. <laughs> Kingston is terrifying. Okay, so quick quick segue, side sidebar here. I never thought that there'd be a mascot that was more terrifying than Kingston. And then along came Gritty. I like to see him fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> With lightsabers. No, nah, I just want to just like a UFC fight. Oh, Kingston versus Gritty. Let's make it happen. As long as, that, as, long as, no, as, long as no one's jumping the cage. It's <laughs> <laughs> another terrifying mascot jumps in. It's like a Royal royal Rumble. Let's make it happen, folks. Kingston versus Gritty. An all-out brawl. Tweet us. Tweet, you know, let us know what your, th- th- uh, your thoughts on that, too, over at OSJ Soccer on Twitter as well. So, um, Other than that, uh, let's end it here. <laughs> all righty. Well. Kingston versus Gritty. That's how we're going to end it. All right, that's been Mike Romajo. I've been Austin David. That's a truck behind us. We're going to get out of here. Thanks for listening. See you later. See you later, guys.